All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Joseph Wong. He's going to talk about money um, lenders, licenses, um, Bitcoin, the basic law, a um, lot of things to talk about. Uh, we have drinks. If you want some drinks, uh, then just uh, let me know or get them from the fridge. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, Joseph. All right. So, so, so um, I run a company called Bitcoin Research uh, Laboratories Asia Limited. It is license money lender number 811-2015, and I need to quote this, any, any advertising. And uh, we do uh, loans funded in Bitcoin. So uh, since this is on YouTube, uh, if any of you YouTubers get bored about me talking, um, there's uh, uh, any of you uh, British comedy fans? Okay, uh, there's an episode of Faulty Towers called War of Salad which will encapsulate exactly what happened with me and, and the Hong Kong bureaucracy. Uh, right. So the first thing is, okay, what does FinTech have to do with constitutional law? Um, and th th this is a weird combination of the two. Um, the, the reason that FinTech has to do with constitutional law is that most legal interactions you have don't have like weird, broad uh, constitutional issues because um, they're, they're routine. Uh, so example, if you, if you go to uh, get a driver's license, okay, the, the process for you getting a driver's license and all the problems that you get into getting a driver's license is probably similar to like the person in front of you in the line. Uh, FinTech is weird because what happens is that uh, you can't use standard operating procedure, procedures or the standard operating procedures stop working. Uh, and, and at that point, uh, you have to figure out what to do in that case. And that gets you really quickly into constitutional issues. Um, the other thing that happens is that uh, technology changes, something that can change the basic course of society. Um, one of the talks that I did, with, uh, or one of the talks I attended was uh, two years ago in Wanzai, and uh, as I was uh, listening to the talk, uh, the tear gas was going, uh, <laughs> starting to flow at Admiralty. So actually, bef uh, before I attended the talk, I was actually at Admiralty when uh, the demonstrations w were getting going. And one thing that I noticed was that uh, the demonstrations wouldn't have gotten as big as they had without smartphones. Because what was actually happening at, at Admiralty was that as people were getting tear gassed, they were going to the back of the line, you had another group of people coming in front, there were uh, text messages going all over Hong Kong telling people to arrive with supplies and uh, plastic wrap and uh, they were setting up supply depots. And uh, what happened in Hong Kong was actually quite interesting in two years ago because uh, what basically happened was the police got out of uh, Occupy Hong Kong is, is unique because it is the only instance I can think of um, in the past 20 years where you had a situation where demonstrators and the police came into a confrontation and the demonstrators won. Uh, and it was all because of technology. So technology can sometimes change the fundamental rules of society. So um, what constitutional law is, is, is a set of meta rules. So, so you've got rules about uh, what happens uh, when you uh, apply for a driver's license. Then you've got rules about how to change those rules. And then change, and eventually you get rules about changing rules about changing rules. And that gets you quickly constitutional. Um, so that actually is important because it tells you uh, what you should do if you don't know what to do. Um, so let me go into the basic problem when I, um, I, I did talk about this. The basic problem in FinTech, right? So everybody is talking about how uh, London is speeding ahead of Hong Kong, how Singapore is speeding ahead of Hong Kong. And my argument is that the basic problem with Hong Kong and FinTech has to do with the constitutional structure of Hong Kong. Um, so one of the things that happens is that um, I was actually talking to a um, person who was uh, in a, involved in a regulatory issue uh, with a Hong Kong monetary thing. He says, and he says that everything that the uh, HKMA makes sense, if you imagine you're talking to them as if they were living in 1984. Um, and it turns out that uh, there's a reason for that. You, you notice in Hong Kong that um, it is hard to change anything because what happens is that uh, the moment some small group complains, the government backs down. And that's actually by design because um, essentially Hong Kong uh, Run, is run now by rules that were set up in the 1980s. And the rules basically say that nothing based, I mean literally, it says in the, the Sino British Joint Declaration in the base law, nothing basically changes until 2047. And that's one of the reasons why FinTech is such a hard time in Hong Kong is because 
the system was specifically designed to freeze Hong Kong as it, it was 1985, which is no longer in, which is no longer the case. Um, so, getting back to the money lending license. Uh, first of all, I, 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 well, I sort of needed the license in order to do certain things, but. Um, it turns out that you don't need a money lending license if you want to do uh, secured loans to companies or uh, anything that involves import or export of goods and services. Uh, so if somebody wants to set up a website and they need a loan from me, okay, that, uh, assuming that they're exporting services outside of Hong Kong, you don't need a license for that. Um, so that was very important because what happened was that uh, because uh, the license was useful rather than necessary, I wasn't under any financial pressure to sort of settle with the police early. Um, I did need the experience of pushing something to the Hong Kong uh, bureaucracy and judiciary. Uh, one of the things I actually figured out is that I think I'll actually make more money doing regulatory consulting than I would uh, through money lending. And I actually wanted to ba beta test some constitutional theories of mine. Uh, and so one of the reasons that, that I wanted to do this with something that was very um, sort of unimportant was that if it turned out that uh, my ideas on how the basic law should work turn out to be total trash, that nothing seriously bad happens. Uh, I, I don't get my license, but nothing burns, and uh, uh, you don't have tanks in the streets or something like that. So let me go through uh, the outline of this talk. Uh, first, I'll go through a timeline and then sort of a, a discussion of the legal framework. I want to focus mo mostly on the people, uh, the people that I met. They were all really nice people, and, and this is one of the frustrating things about working with the Hong Kong bureaucracy and judiciary. They're just extremely nice people. Uh, and, and after a while, you just go crazy because they're so nice to you. Uh, and, and they're nice to you, but nothing gets done. Um, th then I'll go into some of the, 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 legal, the specific legal arguments I used and some of the, the long-term implications. So one of the slides, uh, if you've seen Zootopia, uh, it's the, 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 the uh, visit to the uh, DMV. So, uh, bureaucracy was invented by the Chinese and perfected by the British, and this is the perfect Hong Kong bureaucrat here. Uh, and you will see this, um, a lot of dealing with the Hong Kong um, bureaucracy and judiciary is just realize that they're nice people that operate under a different time scale. Um, so one of the th funny things that came in was that uh, when I actually went to my first court hearing, okay, uh, I, I really didn't know what was gonna happen. So, so I had all my arguments prepared and I, I figured, okay, uh, I'd go to the court hearing, either by lunch I'd win or lose, and then, and then I'd have a lunch. And th this is what the timeline looks like. Uh, so in May of 2015, I submitted the, the application. Uh, then we had a police uh, interview and site, license, uh, site inspection in June of 2015. Uh, in July of 2015, I got the, the letter of objection with six objections. Um, and in August 15, uh, 2015, I had my first court hearing. It lasted for five minutes. Uh, literally, what happened was that the judge basically said, okay, uh, is, is the defendant here? Yes, okay. Is the uh, are, are the police here? Yes. Is the company registry here? Yes. Does the company registry have any objection? No. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll postpone the hearing for eight months. No, eight weeks. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 I mean, literally. Uh, so uh, so I, I actually put together some of my arguments and, and sent them uh, to a le as a letter to the, 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 uh, the Hong Kong police. In uh, October 2015, okay, this is after eight weeks, we had the second hearing. Again, it lasted for five months. Uh, I, I was all prepared, I had everything ready, and the police came up and said, okay, we'd like to have a, a, a delay for another eight weeks because we need to handle uh, one of the exemptions that, 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 that the, 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 the uh, person presented, okay? So the judge says, okay, do you have any objections? I said, well, okay, eight weeks, okay. So, another eight weeks. Um, okay, the next hearing lasts for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so, so you go the, before the judge, um, and I think one of the, oh, uh, uh, one of the people was actually here, um, the judge actually literally starts screaming at the police. Uh, because basically what happens is that the, the judge says, okay, uh, okay, well, you're already right. And, uh, and, then, and then the police say, no, no, we're not quite ready. It's a, has the defendant received all the documents? The, well, no. Uh, and, and then, and then uh, the, the, the judge actually, li I'm not talking figuratively, literally starts screaming at the police. When I have a court order, I expect it to be followed. What is your excuse for not following this order? And then the, 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 no, no, we'll get it done by the end of the... The thing. And, and so, so it was actually funny because I got, I got a bundle of documents uh, at 6 p.m. that day and I have a feeling that they, they were all freshly photocopied. So, so it was very much like uh, 
uh, getting called to the principal and, and just trying to make any excuse possible. Uh, but uh, very soon after that, I got uh, they removed three of the objections. All right. So we are now in January 2016. Okay. Uh, this is the, the the only hearing that la that had any substantive uh, argument to it, and that lasted for about an hour and a half. Um, the, the the and I'll go through the the, um, the, the judges. Uh, the, the, the previous um, hearings went before what I call the scheduling judge. And the scheduling judge does routine uh, motions. Uh, normally when you get a money lending license and they don't have any objections, you have, uh, and this was kind of annoying to see because right in front of me right, were, were like 30 people, I, I, I think it was around 30 people, who had literally applied for money lending license, they had no objections, so it's okay, no objections, okay, you, you all get money lending licenses, and then I was in the back of the line. Um, so uh, this, this hearing actually lasted for an hour and a half, uh, and it was before uh, what, what I would call a trial judge. Um, so then, uh, this was the only hearing that had any sort of legal kung fu, and I'll go into it exactly. I mean, it, it, was, it was wonderful. Um, so, so then we had another hearing which lasted for 15 minutes. Uh, at that point, the police uh, gave me a letter with one objection, um, and that I, was that I was not a fit and proper, uh, well, that I did not pro provide enough documentation to prove that I was a fit and proper person to conduct money lending. I, I have a PhD in astrophysics. Uh, I worked at a major bank for seven years, but uh, I couldn't provide them with the necessary documentation. And I'll get into why they came up with a brilliant argument. It was absolutely wonderful. So uh, we go to the, the day of the, the final showdown, right? And so, so I, at that point, everything's prepared. Uh, literally the day before that hearing uh, appeared, I got a, a letter from the, the, the Hong Kong police saying that uh, essentially the, the, uh, the, the, uh, they want to settle the case. Um, so, so what happened was that there was some brief last minute uh, back and forth because what happened was that the, the lawyer from the Hong Kong police basically said, uh, since, um, since, since uh, we don't have any objections, we'd like to cancel the hearing tomorrow and reschedule another hearing so that the license to be rubber stamp, and then they got a letter back from from the the, the, uh, the judge saying hearing. I mean, it, it, it was that it, the, the letters are, are, are wonderfully written. It says uh, we have. It was a letter from the clerk, right? The, the judge never directly talks to you, so it was a letter from the clerk. Is that we have placed a request before the her, his worship. Uh, his worship is directed the following: hearing tomorrow to stand. Please inform the, the person. So, so, so we went to the hearing, and that lasted for five minutes. Uh, basically, the judge looked at us and said, "Okay." Since there are no objections, you get the license. Um, so, so this is this is a very interesting thing because um, this talk will last longer than uh, the judicial hearings. Um, so let me go through through the the, the, the laws that are involved. Okay, um, I want to go through the money lending ordinance because it is an extraordinarily well written piece of legislation. Uh, I mean, it is what financial regulation should be in Hong Kong, um, and. The reason why is that, okay, so, so the basic procedure was it was drafted by, uh, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, one person, Attorney General uh, John Calvert Griffiths, QC. Uh, and and he, he's actually a major, major attorney in the history of Hong Kong. Um, and one of the not nice things about uh, the money lending law is that I think because one person, dra or maybe he had some help, but not too many people drafted it. It's actually a very short law, and it's not like the, these 300, 400 pages laws when you have committees of 50 people talking about it. Um, so, so the way that it works is that, that there's a registry that's administered by the company registry. And apparent, from, from my, my, my understanding, the company registry actually, um, if there was an objection by the financial services people, would go through the company registry. Uh, and I, my, my guess is that the type of uh, objections that the company registry would deal with is that if, for example, you, you, your name is like 3,000 letters or something, so, so something administrative. Um, so so the, the, um, the police are responsible for doing an investigation, an interview, and a site visit. Uh, and they actually do visit the site of the, the, uh, the, the money lending location. Um, the interesting thing about the money lending ordinance is that anybody can submit an objection. So if anybody, uh, uh, for example, my license is up for renewal next year, uh, if anybody uh, in Hong Kong objects to me getting a money lending license. They can act, as long as they do it in a timely manner, they can actually submit an objection at which point the thing will go to court. Um, so, 
if there is no, if there, this is this is one of the important things. If there is no objection within 60 days after the the uh, application is submitted, you automatically get the license. Um, if there are any objections, then the licensing court uh, decides. And uh, there are a list of criteria, but there are basically two really important ones. Whether you're a fit and proper person and whether the premises that you're doing money lending from are suitable for money lending. Um, so so here, here's why the MLO, I think, is, is just a great law. First of all, uh, unlike any other financial regulation in Hong Kong, it was actually drafted uh, specifically for Hong Kong. So uh, if you look at the SFO or the, uh, the, the, the Securities Finance Ordinance, the Banking Ordinance, uh, the Counterterrorism Ordinance, they basically took some law that was operating in England or, or maybe a little bit from the US and just copied it uh, for Hong Kong. Now, in the case of the Money Lending Ordinance, what happened is in the 1970s, uh, the UK rewrote their uh, money lending uh, system. So they have uh, what I believe is called the Consumer Credit Act. Um, and in the case of Hong Kong, they decided not to do this. They decided to actually take the, the money lending law, which was drafted in 1927, and, and make some formal amendments to it. Um, so, so one of the important things, and this actually became really important uh, during the, 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 the discussions, is that um, in the, the legislative discussion, the, the, the person who drafted the law specifically said, okay, the purpose of this law is, is to prevent uh, organized crime and criminal activity within money lending. It, they specifically said that um, the intent of the law was to have, not even to inconvenience uh, anybody who had, runs a legitimate business. Uh, and um, they did actually a pretty good job because um, th there are two aspects of the money lending law that, that make it different from any other financial regulation I know of in Hong Kong. The first is there's a time limit. Now, one of the things that's happened with the money services law, right? And, and in 2012, they passed the counterterrorism law, uh, and the idea was, okay, these are going to be rubber stamps because you've got ten, you've got a thousand uh, money exchange stores, and, and I think most of them are, are, are fairly legitimate. Um, but the problem is that, that that law doesn't have a time limit. So, so what happens is that the police can sort of drag this on for months and months and years, and, and the problem is that until the police actually say no, you actually don't have much of a grounds to go to court. Because there's nothing, uh, there's there's no action that you can actually sue them against because they haven't said no. But but in the case in the case of the money lending license, they have 60 days. Now th this also is important because that 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 deter that makes means that the police have to decide who uh, what battles to fight and what battles they don't fight. Because there are 4,000 money lenders in Hong Kong, because they they have they're under limited time, they have to say okay these are the people that are really really bad, and, and we're going to try to get rid of them. And and if there's if there's uh, 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 sort of a gray case, then, then then it's a matter of how much time and energy do we want uh, to fight this. Um, the other thing about the money lending law is that you're not negotiating with God. So so l let's look, take any other financial regulatory law in Hong Kong, right? Uh, the HKMA, uh, the uh, banking ordinance, or the SF, uh, the Securities Futures Ordinance. You are negotiating with God, or you're not really negotiating with God. You're actually begging for mercy from God. Uh, you, um, if, you, if you're in a situation where you're, you're trying to get a license for a securities business or a banking business, you're talking to somebody that, can, that just has the power to say, no, you're not going to get a license. So you're in a situation where you're actually begging for the license. Uh, and if your view of uh, what constitutes a legitimate business is different from, from the uh, Hong Kong Monetary Authority or the uh, Securities and Futures Ordinance, then you've got, an actual, you've got a big problem. Um, now, in the case of, of the money lending license, what happens is that, and this is, this, this is very important, is that the police actually don't hand you the license. The license is handed by the court. If the police or anybody else in Hong Kong has a problem with you having a license, then you both go to God, and then God decides. But that means that, that you, you're on an equal basis with the, the, the authorities, which is not the case when, when you apply for any other license. Um, so the next thing I want to go through is just a, a, a brief prime, primer of uh, administrative law. So, so Benny Tai, uh, the name should sound familiar, he's the guy that, that sort of started to occupy uh, Hong Kong. He's also uh, a brilliant teacher as far as uh, administrative law. If you go to that website, it's got this most wonderful introduction to administrative law in Hong Kong. Um, so the, the, the most important rule that I, I want to bring into um, is uh, what I call the Wensbury rule or the Wensbury Reasonable School. 
So this is an actual, this is actually an interesting case. Um, what happened in 1948 was that there was a uh, theater uh, that wanted to license to, uh, to, to show uh, movies. And they went to the local government, and the local government said, okay, we'll give you the license, but um, on Sundays, uh, children under 15 cannot attend any of your movies, uh, regardless of whether they're with an adult or not. And the, um, the uh, motion picture uh, company sort of sued the local government and said, okay, this is crazy. Uh, I mean, this doesn't make any sense. And, um, and they lost. And they, they established a standard for overturning an administrative decision uh, uh, by, by an administrative agency. And a court will overrule an administrative agency under, a, there's some other situations, but this is the main one. If the decision is so outrageous in its defiance and logic and accepted moral standards that no sensible person who had applied this mind to the question uh, to be decided could have possibly arrived at it. So, 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 so in, in, in other words, um, it's going to be really, really tough to, to overturn a decision. I mean, you have to show that it is so utterly insane that, that no human being could have come up with it. Um, and, 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 and that's hard. Um, but there's a reason why it's hard. Um, first of all, uh, British judges, and, and th th this is uh, uh, the way that, that uh, Hong Kong judges are, 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 um, are, are trained. They do not want to make well, what are what we call political decisions. Um, the idea is in, in Britain that, okay, let's suppose the government imposes this, this, this standard that you don't like. It's not the purpose of the British courts to overturn the standard. Right. What you should do is you should, you should go to the legislature, vote the bums out, and, and change the law. Now, you see that there's going to be a problem in Hong Kong if you apply that, that rule here. Um, the other thing about British administrative law is it doesn't look at legislative intent. And again, th th there's, a, there's a reason why. Uh, basically what happened, uh, well, I mean, th there's been some weakening somewhat of that. Uh, Pepper versus Hart is the main decision. But, but, but for the most part, uh, they don't, you don't look at transcripts of debates, you don't look at uh, uh, committee reports. And, and the reason why is that uh, when, when, when a, a British law goes to parliament, you're talking about like, uh, I believe it's 650 people. So, so what happens is that, that if you were to actually try to figure out what the legislative intent is, you've got people arguing with each other and, and, and it's, it's just gonna be a mess. Because you've got people arguing one way, you've got people arguing another way. If I show you that, uh, uh, somebody in this committee room said this, while well, somebody else might have argued against us. And, 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 and judges did, in, in Britain just don't want to touch that. Um, the other thing about uh, the British system, which you'll actually find to be in this situation, is that it, it has a lot of unwritten rules. And sometimes what looks like what uh, the way the system works is actually not how it works. Uh, if you look at, uh, if, if you're a space alien and you come to the, uh, the, the planet Earth, and, and you just look at the written laws of, of, of United Kingdom, you will be under the impression that there's this huge dictator by the name of Elizabeth II who makes all these decisions and, and, and command. I mean, you look at all these law by the command of Elizabeth II, the, the, the Queen of uh, um, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I order you to do this um, uh, by the grace of God, and it, that's not the way that the British system actually works. Um, so, so what, what ends up happening is the written law makes it look like it's really, really dictatorial, but it's, in fact, it's not. And um, this actually applies to a lot of things that happen in Hong Kong, because what you'll find is that, that there's the, uh, the written statute, and then you'll find that this is the way that things actually work. Now, the problem that you have with, with things like FinTech is that in the case of like uh, the fact that uh, uh, the queen actually selects the prime minister from the person who's, who's most likely to be the uh, uh, who's got the most support in Parliament. These are things that sort of everybody knows because it's so widespread that the knowledge is, 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 um, is very uh, diffuse. The problem is that when you get into things like, um, the Hong Kong police have this rule that uh, you, you couldn't open a, a, a money, lending license, uh, money lending business in a co-work space. All right, that's not a written rule. Maybe it's reasonable, maybe it's not. But if you're from some other place, you have no idea that this rule exists because it's not written down anywhere. Um, and and it, it's very different from the US system. Um, so if, if you want a primer on, 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 on the, the British government, uh, circa 1985, this is the best show. It's called Yes Minister. Um, and th th this describes how uh, the British government worked in 1985. And to a large extent, it works. It describes how the Hong Kong government works today. Um, 
So the final thing is the basic law of Hong Kong. Now, uh, the basic law of Hong Kong is actually also an extraordinarily well-written law uh, because they did what most people would have considered as possible. So you have um, mainland Chinese law, which is ger based on uh, German law, and then on top it's got Soviet law on top. It's meant uh, to, to sort of reinforce an authoritarian one-party state. Um, and then you've got Hong Kong, which is based on British law, uh, and it's a very liberal legal system. And, and the worry that people had is that if you look at the laws um, that were written before 1990, before the passage of the Bill of Rights Ordinance, um, they gave the governor of Hong Kong absolute authority to do pretty much anything he wanted to. Uh, the only thing that the governor of Hong Kong couldn't do was to execute you. Uh, but, but there's actually something called the Emergency Regulations Ordinance, which allows the governor to pass regulations that can put you in jail for indefinitely. Now, the issue is that um, the governor, because uh, he was in a political context uh, where, and who's British and British people just don't do these things until, unless it's necessary. It's part, it's part of the cultural uh, aspects. He was under a lot of political, cultural restrictions that kept him from using these rules. Um, and, but the worry is, and, and, and uh, this was a legitimate worry because you see what happens to British colonies uh, in a lot of cases after the British leave, is that you have all these uh, theoretical powers that the British never used, or they used in sort of limited situations. And what, the moment the Union Jack falls down, uh, people just go crazy with the rules. Um, so so uh, what they did in, in the 1990s was that they, they wanted to, to take some of these unwritten rules or these unwritten um, standards and make them written and, and enforce them in concrete. And so you start with the Bill of Rights Ordinance. Uh, one of the important things is uh, what I call the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. Um, that was incorporated in Hong Kong law in uh, around the 1990s. Um, and around 1990s, th th there was a lot of argument because what happened was that China was, was going to Britain saying, look, you, you'd ruled Hong Kong for 150 years without imposing all these restrictions. Why are you imposing these restrictions on us now that you're leaving? And, and so there was a lot of argument uh, before 1997. Now, it turns out there was a lot of argument after 1997, and, and this is not very well known because for the most part, it, it, it turned out to be relatively non-controversial. I mean, uh, what, what tends to happen is that when people are screaming at each other, everybody knows about it, but when, when people actually are, I would say, hugging each other, but they're, they're discussing this in a, a reasonable tone and manner, they come up with something reasonable, people don't talk about it very much. Uh, but the, 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 um, after 1997, you had all these rules incorporated in the basic law. All right? You have all these rights, you now have ICC property protection. What does this actually mean in practice? Um, and th there was some back and forth. The first thing that the, 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 the Hong Kong courts did was to try to, to, to assert their power on immigration, and that just fell like a lead balloon. Because what happened was the, the Hong Kong courts tried to expand the amount of immigration going into Hong Kong uh, through judicial means. And nobody wanted that. So, but they, they actually found, uh, and, and that was very, very controversial. That happened in the first year. So they, they sort of backed down and then uh, developed things through other means. And so so basically what, what the rules are now, and, and this they're, they're a set of probably 10, um, 10 judicial decisions. Um, and most of them were, 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 um, were uh, done by this guy. Um, his name is Longhair. Um, and what he actually did was he submitted all these court cases to the, the uh